Malcolm Nance is a globally renowned, highly engaging expert on terrorism, extremism, and insurgency, and a multiple New York Times bestselling author whose books include The Plot to Hack America and The Plot to Betray America, among many others. A 34-year Arab-speaking veteran of the U.S. intelligence community's combating terrorism program, he has been called the Neil deGrasse Tyson of counterterrorism. Uh huh. <laughs> and is considered one of the great African Americans in espionage by the International Space Museum. S spy Museum. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah. Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah. Um, and he, he is a counterterrorism ter analyst for NBC News and MSNBC. Joining Nancy in conversation tonight is Zerlina Maxwell. Uh, <laughs> yeah. An MSNBC political analyst, commentator, speaker, and writer. She is also the senior director of progressive programming for Sirius XM and the co-host of the award-winning radio show Signal Boost. Uh, she is the author of The End of White Politics, How to Heal Our Liberal Divide. And so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Malcolm Nance and Zerlina w Maxwell. These mics and those mics, perfect. Perfect. All right. You can hear me. Yeah. Excellent. Perfect. I'm so glad to see all of your faces, um, even if it's just half of the faces. I, I, as I said, <laughs> I want everybody to be safe in here. I don't want you to leave with anything other than very critical information for how to protect American democracy. So we can all in, be in agreement that we're gonna be joining in that effort to keep us all safe, just to start us off. Um, I'm so excited to see Malcolm. First of all, thank you um, for coming and welcome back. Well, Malcolm. Thank you, thank you very That's much. That's first. That's the first thing, Malcolm, you've been um, over in Ukraine. Um, but that's not actually why we're here today. We're here today because we want to talk about the threats to American democracy. Mm -hmm. So in your book, They Want to Kill Americans, uh, you say that when the election was called for Joe Biden, people celebrated in the streets, literally. We all remember those images of people literally on top of cars dancing as if we've overthrown an, a, a dictator like we, we see in other places. Um, we all sort of took a breath. We exhaled a little bit. Maybe we were relieved, right? But you say that was all premature. You also say that this book is an early warning. So what is the threat assessment in your view of um, the ongoing risk and threats to American democracy as you see them? Okay, well, you know, I, I characterize it because everybody wants me to talk about Ukraine a little bit. And I, I did that today with Marty Moskwain for 45 minutes. So you can go listen to that. Um, but when I was in Ukraine, I was trying to uphold the eastern wall of, of global democracy, right? The, the, the bulwark that literally bumps up against Russia, which is a totalitarian state. And while I was over there, every, you know, every once in a while, I'd hear some news, and I would literally have to look over my shoulder to see what was going on on the western wall of, of, of democracy. And that's what's going on back here. And what I would see from time to time has been pretty disturbing. Uh, unfortunately, I wrote this book so that I could add to your angst. <laughs> I don't think you have enough stress in your life. But with the Supreme Court and you know the January 6 hearings, I, uh, as I always do, I tend to write books that are predictive analyses. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, in the intelligence community, we don't. We don't really predict things. We actually do these analyses that give you options and multiple pathways, and sometimes the most likely and the most dangerous courses of action that our opponents take. However, in this particular book, as, as you said, uh, everybody was out celebrating on, on you know, January 4th, 5th, and 6th, uh, and what they thought was going to be a relatively quick count. Joe Biden had been you know, had been uh, indicated that he was the winner. He wouldn't be declared till the 7th. But on the 6th of November, I went on real time with Bill Maher. And Bill was, you know, to his credit was saying, hey, obviously Biden has won. They're going to declare it in a few hours. But we need to, to understand what the Trump voters 
anxiety was. We need to understand what they were upset about, and then we need to reach out to them and do the kumbaya routine. And he said, you know, I, we need to, really need to shy away from doom and gloom. And don't ever use those words in front of me, <laughs> okay? That's a full-time job for me, right? Doom and gloom. So I interjected, oh, you want doom and gloom? I'll give you doom and gloom. How about the United States is heading into a full-scale insurgency? And he, he, he caught on right away. He said, insurgency, you mean like Iraq with Saddam and everything. And I said, yes, we are talking about a sustained campaign, which is what is insurgency is, where one party takes the arguments from the halls of power into the streets and uses paramilitary, political, and in some instances, terrorism to destabilize a legitimate government and try to bring about de, you know, illegitimacy to them to show that they cannot maintain security, they can't maintain infrastructure, they can't maintain power, and that they should be done away with in a insurgent-backed revolution of some sort or the other. When I said that at the time, that's what I was envisaging. But I wasn't envisaging it happening in 62 days. I knew it was going to happen. Okay, throughout, but that night I didn't. I just knew what these people were saying. And what they had been saying for months was that this election would come down to one of two things. If Trump wins, it was very clear to me that the people who were these armed militias, and it's not just militias, it's not just these, the Boogaloo Boys or the Proud Boys or the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters, a new phenomenon was, was happening throughout 2018, 2019, and 2020 was after Charlottesville, those groups were being chased. They were being pushed down, and they weren't materializing. But what was materializing were people who were supporting Donald Trump who decided that their way of protest was to come out with firearms. And then in the summer of 2020, the summer of George Floyd, they were coming out with a lot of firearms. And I, at that point, you would see these big groups, for a good example, Louisville, Kentucky, when about 200 of them were marching up and down the streets in camouflage with rifles. They were not the Oath Keepers or the 3% militia. They were locals who were exercising the same intimidation, raw intimidation power that you would see from these, militia, these other militias and what would become the base of, the, you know, of, of the Trump enforcers. But I realized this is much broader than it is. They have now been melded into a large body of people who were Trump voters, who thought, I am going to exercise my right to protest by carrying a firearm and the implicit threat behind that, which is, and if you cause trouble, I will kill you. And don't come to me, I'm a, I'm a firearms collector. I own you know a whole slew of of practice weapons that, you know, I practice on here in the United States if I have to use overseas, AR-15s, AK-47s, all sorts of exotic things. But don't tell me marching up and down the street wearing body armor helmets, can, you know, multicam camouflage, and carrying an AR-15 with six or seven magazines is not intended to intimidate people. It is only intended to intimidate people. If you had the power of your words, you wouldn't need that at all. Right? You would watch with your, you know, don't tread on me flag or, or whatever else that you want. So when I saw this phenomenon that this is what was coming out against the George Floyd protests, these were people that were viewing themselves as a counterbalance. And they were gaining organizational skills from the, from the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters. But those groups were a fraction of what we were really seeing hit the streets. And we would see this in spades a few months later. So as we were coming into 2020, and I was monitoring their internal communications, where they were chatting with each other, like the Donald.win, or which later would become Patriot.win, it was pretty clear to see that these people had in their mind that with their firearms, they were going to become, if Donald Trump won, the unofficial enforcers of his will. And if you want to call it, the brown shirts or, or whatever. They were just gonna be out in the streets in their Trump flag parades, you know, with their trucks, 
And we saw them all over the place. Only this time they'd be carrying firearms. And they would be pushing their agenda, which is a minority agenda, over the majority of the nation. But because the majority of the nation doesn't vote, you voted for them to have these firearms to come out and do that. So that was one dangerous component of this. The other more dangerous component that I had predicted was that if Trump loses, all of these people go underground for a period of time. And then they will internally organize into an insurgency where they will sit together and talk and have their patriot shooting groups and go out to ranges and have picnics and shoot at Nancy Pelosi targets, uh, which exist. Or they will go out and they will organize in support of Donald Trump. I knew that was coming. So the moment that it was clear that Donald Trump had lost the election, um, I went on air with Real Time on Bill Maher. And I just decided, well, I'm not going to play this media game of let's reach out, let's, let's take a breath, let's say that America has been saved. America wasn't saved. America was kicked hard into a new phase of American history that we were kicked so hard that it looked like 1860 in some places. So I realized we were actually standing into a very dangerous period. And so I did not pull my punch on that show. I said, we are headed into an insurgency. And the dot, dot, dot of that is an insurgency leads to civil war. But I wasn't ready to say that. Look, I'm an intelligence analyst, uh, you know, when I, you know, intelligence collector also. When I see things, I want to see the context of it. I want to see, it, were there any f precedents that leads me to believe that this is a viable threat? Well, there was enormous amounts. But throughout the Donald Trump administration, we were seeing this transformation of the Republican Party away from a political party and into what could only be called a cult. Um, I was a Republican for a good part of my career. I was a Colin Powell style, strong on national security, socially liberal conservative. And if they were on the X, Y axis, I would have been that little dot just above up and to the right. But now in the way that things have changed, I'm way down here <laughs> to the left with Colin Powell when he was alive, <laughs> yes, yeah. right? Ronald Reagan and <laughs> Richard Nixon and all the other hardcore liberal progressives according to the way that people are speaking these days. And that's because the party didn't move. The party is still there. It has transformed. The base has transformed itself into a completely different animal. And that animal is based on two things. The love of Donald Trump. Boom, litmus test. Yes, no, neutral will determine how they treat you, right? And the other one was that you should be consider yourself a patriot who may have to take action and use force to make sure that your love of Donald Trump would be, well, seen by everyone and that it would punish those who did not share that. That was just patently obvious. How obvious, Malcolm? You said you were a gun collector. So obvious. All right, look, I'm a firearms guy, spent my whole life around them. Um, I was monitoring, you know, ammunition prices in the, in the beginning of the COVID outbreak mm -hmm. and the George Floyd protests. But by August of 2020, AR-15 bullets had gone from 39 cents a bullet, which is really a bargain, all right? <laughs> to on average of $1.25 a bullet by the time of the election, which is insane. It had never, ever been there. Even after the great massive Newtown buyout, of, there was so much ammunition sold after Newtown because they thought it was gonna be you know, regulated or boycotted, that it went up to like 89 cents a round. Well, now, I mean, it's, it's come down to about 90 cents a round. But at one point, running up to this election, the belief that they would need every AR-15 bullet in America led people to pay $1.25 per bullet, which is crazy, right? So, especially if you're a gun collector, you, you know that that's insane. And it was an indicator of a pathology out there. 
And it wasn't that there was an absence of bullets. There were a lot of bullets or a lot of manufacturers. It's just that there were an enormous quantity of people buying AR-15s, and they were being told by, you know, gun enthusiasts, you know, or or world without rule of law enthusiasts and survivalists that you needed to have a minimum of 1,000 rounds of ammunition for each firearm that you have. And believe it or not, 9 millimeter Luger was even higher. It was just crazy what was going on there. But these are really solid indicators that there is something happening here that we need to watch. So I watched it. I started monitoring their, their chat rooms. I have a follow-up question. And, oh. <laughs> okay. Just, no, 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 it's related to what you're saying. So you're watching. Yeah. But I, I do want to just refer to one thing you talk about in the book throughout, yeah. which is the acronym TITUS. So what? you say that it's the Trump insurgency, um, the Trump insurgency in the United States, and it's an armed political cult preparing for this insurgency and it's deny attack avenge fear yeah so this phases. is what you're watching right and what i was really watching was these people organize not the boogaloo boys not the proud boys they're easy to monitor these guys are idiots right they all are these wannabe special forces guys proud boys are street thugs they are people they started as a gang that was supposed to physically beat liberals on the street with your bare hands, right? But by George Floyd summer, everybody had an AR-15. Everybody was rocking body armor. Everybody was going out and spending $1,000 on a combat helmet and, you know, wearing, you know, size 52 pants multicam. Um, that was just very common by that point. But what was happening was that, that name, that, uh, that Zerlina said a moment ago, Titus, T-I-T-U-S, was forming. And that stands for the Trump insurgents in the United States. To where it wasn't about being a boogaloo boy and wearing a Hawaiian shirt and preaching accelerationism. That's a given. It wasn't about being an oath keeper, you know, and believing that the entire government is out to get you, right? That's a given. It wasn't about standard operating procedure and white supremacy. That's a given. It's about your loyalty to Donald Trump. And if you were loyal to Donald Trump, you already subscribed to all of those things. You hated Black Lives Matter. Antifa was an enemy like Al Qaeda and ISIS that in your head, you may need to have a gun battle with. Another thing that people were talking about quite a bit was they were talking about, you know, there was always the survivalist world, right? But they were talking about things breaking down so badly, as one, one good analyst on the internet says, world without rule of law. That's what they call it when there's a natural disaster and the cops aren't there. You have to protect yourself. It got so bad, there was actually a fire in Oregon. Just a natural fire broke out in Oregon. And this one town convinced itself that Antifa had set the fires and was coming to the town to set more fires. So they just jumped up, got all their guns, set up roadblocks and checkpoints into the town. And unfortunately, two bloggers from, you know, from Portland drove into this. Right? It could have been bad. And of course, the way it was defused was the police did not arrest anyone. The police did not say, put your weapons on the ground, let me see your hands, right, at the checkpoint with 10, 15 guys. The police were like, would you disperse, take your weapons home, right? This is ridiculous. And I don't even, I'm not even sure to this day whether they said this is ridiculous, right? It was, you, you are not allowed to roadblock these roads, that's our job, right? But it was another indicator of the madness that was now taking over the Titus, that would become the Titus, the Trump insurgents. Now, why do I use that phrase collectively? Because in the intelligence community, we like neat packages. But more importantly, it's better to identify your threat with a cool title, right? Like Islamic State for Iraq and Syria, or, you know, or, 
or Al Qaeda, Al Jihad, whatever you want to call it. But you know, Titus is a pretty solid acronym for people who it's all about Donald Trump. It's not about America. It's about a version of America that exists right here, right? There's an old uh, one, one, one second. There's an old story from The Onion where they, a uh, few years back, which is now a documentary <laughs> newspaper, right? It's the paper of record for America. And the story in The Onion was, man pledges allegiance to the Constitution in his head. And it's like a, a wild melange of the, of the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence, this, and the Pledge of Allegiance that this man thinks is the Constitution, right? And it's right, it's in his head. Mm -hmm. And all of this was a mass hysteria stemming from the really crazy words of Donald Trump, which was forming the walls on their belief system. And then enter QAnon, right? Which is a crazy group, and I know you're gonna get to that. But this all came together and was ready and poised and cocked on November 4th. And when they didn't get what they wanted, they denied reality, right? They believed that Donald Trump should just declare himself president. And then they lit a match that, that showed you who Titus was on January 6th. 40,000 people. Oh, by the way, Ben Shapiro really got mad when I said on Bill Maher that the Park Service had counted these people and there were 40,000 people at the rally. Donald Trump said a million, right? But, and then 10,000 of them attacked at the Capitol. And you can see an easy two, three, four thousand if you just look down the steps on one spot. And he was like, that's a lie. You lie. There were not 40,000 people at that thing. And I remember sitting there on Bill Maher's show looking at him going, either this is an act, or he never learned arithmetic, or he thought it was a million. But he, he really, you know, he's a, he's a propagandist, so he doesn't know. He's, he's, you know, when he does his little angry chipmunk routine, right? And I thought, this is a level of denial that's dangerous. And you saw Titus emerge. The front end of those people were the militias, the terrorist groups, the Proud Boys, the organizers. But the rest of them were not part members of those groups. I want to talk about January 6th specifically because you've explained in, you know, in detail all of the organizing that took place between the election and the right. election being called and what we saw on January 6th. And I think throughout these hearings, the understanding that we all have of what happened on that day has completely changed because right. I wasn't aware there was so much planning. <laughs> it looked more random than we know now. Talk about the planning. Talk yeah. about what was happening behind the scenes and why it's incredibly dangerous going forward for any future elections. Well, you know, the planning was very obvious to me. The January 6th committee is just getting to revealing what most, you know, uh, extremist intelligence analysts were seeing in real time, principally in November and December. But I had been seeing a lot of these gun groups and patriot, you know, uh, range party groups get together and start saying, you've got to get tactical training by the time of the election. And there were people, there were gun ranges, there was a SEAL, um, ex-Navy SEAL, who was actually running Patriot classes. Who needs Patriot classes in close quarter battle? Who is going to come through a door and, you know, and have to clear a room in an urban warfare environment? Not somebody that's shooting paper, right? Not somebody that's trying to gain his proficiency at 800 yards. No, that's a person who plans on doing battle in close quarters. So we were seeing all of that, and it was becoming frantic in the run-up to the election. But after that, the organization between the leader of the Proud Boys talking to the leader of Patriot Front, uh, not Patriot Front, of the Oath Keepers, that was happening a lot. And they were saying it. I met with X. I met with Y. And by the December 12th protest in Washington, D.C., where they were preparing to do armed combat with Antifa, which, by the way, that's everyone in this room, right? 
If you're, they're like ISIS, and I'm not joking. ISIS's core philosophy is, if you're not one of us, we can kill you, right? You have to join us to survive. So these guys were coordinating with all these groups, and I have a whole chapter of it in there that they are just talking about this week. I, I want to point out again, this book was done last August. It was finished. You're reading a product that was a year ahead of these briefings. And now, another thing that I do in this book is, I go out even further as to what's going to happen after this. So, you know, talking about them organizing is just natural. And in many instances, I had to go back and say, there is a gap of information here. This is how intelligence community does it. Talk, 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 blank space, blank space, talk, talk, talk. Okay, there are two conversations I'm missing here. What did they say? Well, they would have to say whatever impacts the next conversation. And we could almost recreate their meetings. Mm. And now the January 6th committee has their records and they have all of those meetings. And they were a literal army organizing. Yeah, I think anybody that reads this book will be blown away by how much in it um, has been confirmed by the committee. And again, he said he wrote it over a year ago. So the Proud Boys and Oath Keepers marching to the Capitol on the, in that first hearing where they showed them going there before the rally, that's in the book. Yeah. Um, you know, this book contract was signed <laughs> on December 14th, 2020. That's how far ahead I wrote this book, started this book. So it, this stuff was a tsunami. Mm -hmm. And all, you know what it's like? It's like looking out on the beach and the, all the waves are gone. There's just boats sitting on sand. Mm. And what you're looking at now is the after tsunami. Oh, this is a, I hope everybody's doing all right. Just take deep breaths. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what do we do about it? What are the short term and longer term solutions to actually protect and preserve American democracy given this Trump insurgency? Well, you know, the first thing I don't, I, you know, I said to a friend of mine, I said, I hate the phrase, please buy my book, please buy my book. Um, this is a f far more accurate and one that will last longer than virtually every other book that I've written. You know, I've written several intelligence analyses, uh, but this one is going to have very long legs. And it, at some point, God forbid, but it's going to happen, something's going to happen. There's going to be a critical incident, and you're going to go, give me that book. What was that group again? And there's going to be, like, okay, this is like a little intelligence battle manual. Well, I had to categorize it that way. And, you know, reading and learning about just how emergent this threat is, is your best defense, right? I get people in the street all the time. Malcolm, should I buy a shotgun? Should I buy a pistol? No! None of you, first off, none of you need a handgun, all right? None of you. That's just a child killing machine. All right. Second, unless you're hunting ducks, all right. And my late wife loved ducks because she was a great cook. Um, you don't need, you don't, you know, you generally don't need a rifle or a shotgun in your house. Okay. The weapon you have is the one that you know. I'm a, I'm a Philadelphian. I am a real originalist. Okay. When I was a kid, I could go down to right where it all happens, right where it all was written, the Fifth and Sixth and Chestnut and Market Street and. Immu you know, and inure myself in, in the feeling of the American Revolution and feel proud of it as a native of that city, right? But the one thing that they gave us was the one tool that, what is it, 60% of us don't use at all, which is voting. Voting is a lethal weapon, politically lethal, not physically lethal, but it is a lethal weapon, all right? And our biggest problem is, is that we think of elections as these things that, you know, civic obligation that I should do, but I don't want to do. And midterms are the worst because you think, well, it's not going to matter. I'm going to tell you right now, all right, I know this is a book about an insurgency and it has to deal with the they in my book. By the way, in case you guys wonder, who is the they and they want to kill Americans? It's your neighbors. Right? And, and you will know who they are when the time manifests itself. Go watch one of those, you know, ISIS-like 
Trump convoy parades. Go back and look and think of who those people are. That's the most motivated people out there. But there's a subfraction of that group that wants to shoot you. Right? And we remember that quote in Oregon that was Charlie Kirk's uh, speech where the guy goes, when can we start using our guns? Right? When can we start killing? We, we need to start killing these people because they stole an election. Well, there you go. That's one guy. What happened? People clapped in that audience. I look at you and I think, when are we getting double espressos? <laughs> right? And vote. Because that's the only way that you're going to prevent what's coming this November, which could literally be the end of the American experiment. Now, there are people on our opponent's side who are saying the exact same thing. Only they're saying, and I'm going to get my AR-15, and I'm going to kill to keep the image that I have made up or have listened to from Donald Trump or a crazy guy who thinks that we're all drinking blood of children in order to keep ourselves young, because obviously it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> and it certainly doesn't make people lose weight. So, but they believe this stuff. The way that I did analyses of ISIS, and I remember writing my, writing my book, Defeating ISIS, which was another New York Times bestseller, and somebody said, what's the worst thing you read? And it was how they were authorized to rape children, right, in a certain way before they got married. And I took my manuscript and I threw it across the room and I said, that's the craziest thing I ever read. And then they started beheading people and throwing people off of buildings with hooks, and I thought, oh, that was the beginning of it. That was the tip of the iceberg. This book is the same thing. It is about people who should be normal, who have now motivated themselves into believing they can be judge, jury, and executioner of their will against normal people, normies, as they call you. So what is, if there is one, a political solution? You talk a lot about the Republican Party in your book and how... Um, in, in certain ways, they've enabled um, this insurgency. So is there any solution politically in terms of marginalizing some of those voices? Or is, it, is the Republican Party now this just Trump insurgency party? Well, no, the party is the Trump insurgency party. I don't have to tell you that, right? The, you know, listen to former Republicans. Look at, listen to Lynn Cheney. You know, Joe Walsh is one of my favorites now. I remember I used to hate Joe Walsh. <laughs> And you're like, oh, my God, you're a radical. I mean, you, you make me embarrassed to ever say I was a Republican. Joe Walsh, you think I'm down on the lower corner of the XY axis? Joe Walsh is a hardcore Republican, and he's down left middle, right? That's how far the party has left him behind. And he says the party must be dismantled utterly. It does not exist as a beneficial political system in the United States. And when I say dismantle, I mean common sense and cooler heads need to prevail and that people need to stop thinking about guns as a solution. Because you're not a patriot in the way of the American Revolution. There are not 32,000 soldiers doing an amphibious landing operation, you know, that came from England in your backyard and that you need to get on your horse and you grab your musket for, all right? And another thing, this is where the, the pathology of it, the craziness of it has really gripped some of these people. They really believe that Hugo Chavez, who was dead 13 years, had a secret plan to seize this election using Chinese voting machines, all right? If I, yeah, I'll tell you a little secret about the intelligence community. We have Christmas parties. <laughs> when I was at the National Security, I'm sorry, the guys at NSOC at NSA are going, oh, don't, don't tell them about this. We would have these little Christmas parties and we would take out some of the stupidest traffic from the intelligence world that we saw that year. And we would read it out loud, right? Like, you know, I won't, I, I'll make something up because then I'll get in trouble at my top secret clearance strip forever. But, you know, it's just like, you know, a, a Chinese amphibious landing takes place in central Mongolia, right? In the middle of a desert. And they spray paint the beach there, right? 
don't laugh. This stupid stuff happens. And when you read the reports, you're like crying and peeing on yourself. <laughs> Until recently, these stories I'm telling you would have been read at the Christmas party, right? Hillary Clinton steals the blood of frightened children with Huma Abedin in, right, in order to, right, at our hostage barricade facility next door, right, and Comet Ping Pong. And to get the, the, the adrenal gland of a child running to fuel her, her youth serum. Okay, literally the plot of Monsters, Inc., the movie, remember? Monsters have to scare the children. The children, you know, they're, you know, exert a pheromone or something, and they collect it in Monsters' world, and it powers their world. Okay, someone came out and said that they were Q, right? This mysterious, deep, underground U.S. intelligence guy that didn't seem to know anything other than that Hillary Clinton was going to be arrested and all liberals were going to be rounded up and executed. And it's so excited, millions upon millions upon millions of Americans that thought, oh my God, this is going to be great. And they kept using phrases like, it will be like TV. It will be the greatest show ever done. I started seeing that stuff and started thinking, $1.25 a bullet, huh? These people are going to push it up to $2 a bullet. You could just feel the craziness in their heads spinning. My problem is they're not backing away from this. QAnon ideology has now consumed the Republican Party. What, they were the, Trump's most loyal followers, but they're still down in Dealey Plaza waiting for John F. Kennedy to return, all right? They think that John F. Kennedy Jr., who died in a plane crash, is alive and gonna run for vice president with Donald Trump, all right? They're crazy is the informed intelligence term we would use, right? <laughs> and I never used that in my entire life except for v voodoo protective techniques of West Africa. But I, I saw that one time. Uh, but what we have here, and, and here's another thing. They're watching us on this program because they like to watch the enemy and see what they say. I had on my Twitter feed today, somebody- I'm not was, your enemy you're if not, you were watching. Not, no. No, we're Fel your, my fellow Americans. We're your fellow Americans, but they don't view it that way. And when I say the they, you're going to know who they are. They're going to manifest themselves. Today on my Twitter feed, someone had listened to my NPR interview about threats to America and that Trump voters, a segment of Trump voters equal Titus. And they gave me death threats, <laughs> as if to say, you know, I need to prove your very point by coming on Twitter and threatening your life because we don't really think that way. This is insane. They, they, they don't even hear themselves. The problem is this is going to become a national security problem. The FBI is already bumping into walls because on January 6th, the, the, the best camouflage in the history of America was applied. White skin approaching law enforcement and they managed to close upon their opponents and still have that Cheshire Cat smile on their face and smash cops in the face with an American flag and then raise the Trump flag over the Capitol in place of the American flag. There is a serious problem going on here and I'm sure you have another question about it. Well, I did <laughs> want to open it up for audience questions um, and I know that you may have them. I just want to preface that with um, if you don't get to your question within the first 10 seconds, you know, when it's a more of a comment than a question type no of situation, comments. I'm going to cut you off. I'm a really nice person. I don't like confrontation. So <laughs> just please make sure to ask your question. There is a microphone here if you would like to ask a question. Um, I'll just, anybody want to get up and come ask? I will give you a moment to get settled. Perfection. Okay, 10 seconds, I'm counting. All I'm saying is that, you know, you know what I'm <laughs> saying. Everybody knows what I mean. Hey, that's right? common. Everybody knows, yes. <laughs> One of the things January 6th committee hasn't discussed is why the National Guard was kept in the armory. I mean, they're talking about other things. We have a great D.C. National Guard here. 
-hmm. and we have uh, neighboring National Guards in Virginia and Maryland. Mm -hmm. And what happened there, and why isn't it coming out what happened about that? I suspect they'll get around to that. Uh, what they're doing now is laying out the conspiracy. And it was very clear to everybody that day. In fact, I said on MSNBC in live coverage that evening as I was watching it, I said, uh, people are like, oh, they're protesters. I said, what you're seeing here is extremely dangerous. There is somewhere in these groups organized teams of what we call in the business murder cells. And they are self-appointed or trained teams of two, three, five people whose job is to work through that sea of humanity, find specific targets, execute them, or to get people to start murdering people. And I've seen that in, 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 on the other side of the world. But as I saw that pro I, protest, I, I started seeing that. Remember the stack, the group they called the stack from the Oath Keepers? I saw them with their hands on each other's shoulder, identical helmets, and I was like, that's possibly a murder cell. There is no way these people didn't organize this. 40,000 people around them, 10,000 in this mass. I've got six people who are going in there, and they look like they've got purpose, right? And I, I kept thinking, how, how, if someone is not inside, right, who is not recognizing this, this could be very, very bad. So with the National Guard taking hours and hours to go three blocks, right, the, uh, Michael Flynn's brother, being a general who was part of the decision-making cell to the point where the army lied about it. And then the next a couple of days later, I, yeah, yeah, he actually was part of the group that said, don't send the National Guard in. Again, I'm sorry to say it, the camouflage of you know, middle-class white Americans who were there for a rally and a protest was the camouflage that allowed them to overcome the police and law enforcement. And it'll happen again. We see that camouflage applies when people aren't being shot to death for stupid things that I would get shot to death for just picking up my espresso cup. You know? And it's probably because I drink espresso. You know? Your question. Uh, so the white camouflage comment, I think, is so insightful. And when I look back on what I have seen, right, it was the Tea Party tax raises are a villain it's an enemy and then it was money is speech and now with the recent supreme court ruling it's guns are technically speech right so i heard you comment on the bullet price rising and i've heard a lot of debate about so do i need a gun and i love what you said about yeah. no it's a child killer please please don't buy more guns especially handguns if you don't don't, don't. Don't if buy you don't it. You're not need training. a gun, don't buy a gun. <clears throat> but what what is there to the strategy of just buying the bullets to drive the price up? Because the only weakness I see amongst the community of white camouflaged people is that they are economically challenged and driving up the price of bullets where it's like, I'll find a place to keep these. I don't really want to, but if, if all I can do is bankrupt you in, in stocking up, I don't want to learn how to use a gun. I don't want to own a gun. I don't really want to be around them. But I know how to keep bullets safe. Before, before I criticize your comment. No, that's why uh, I need to know what's wrong with When it. I was in Iraq in, in 2003, I made a proposal to L. Paul Bremer, the U.S. General Consul there, that, I give, that we be given $50 million and I buy every spare gun on the Iraqi gun market. I drive the price of AK-47s through the roof. And then, you know, because it's free money, right? They were like $75 for an AK, fully automatic AK-47. And our wasn't to drive the price up for the insurgents. It was for the insurgent's wife to sell his gun, right? <laughs> right. And go, hey, and our, we, we had a motto. You have weapons? You know, you have weapons, we have cash. That was our motto. And his chief financial officer was like, this is brilliant. We could buy out this insurgency, which was only like a few weeks into it. Bremer saw it and he goes, there's no insurgency. Your idea may have some merit to the guys on gunbroker.com who sell bulk ammunition because they would love for this price to go up to $2 a bullet, $4 a bullet. But the bulk manufacturers are going to still manufacture millions upon millions of rounds and sell them at $2, $3 a bullet. And there is always some guy out there who's going to go, I have to do my plinking. 
all right, so I can be ready for the, you know, the, the zombies, which is what they call you, or, you know, when the world without rule of law comes, uh, and they'll be more than willing to spend their child's, you know, bread money, you know, milk money on bullets. And uh, as sad as that sounds, it's true. They are not economically distressed, by the way. The Washington Post said, wasn't it like 65 percent? Mm -hmm of Trump supporters are upper middle class, $75,000 and up who have a second home or a b big bass boat or something like that. So, so even the most recent witness was like, well, I lost my home. And I was like, well, you had one. That was so interesting yeah. that you had a home. You owned okay, a home. That does, was, does that make buybacks a very valuable No, buybacks solution? are buybacks are worthless. Okay. They're, they're worthless. They're good around the edges because your ma will sell your gun. But there are gun dealers that will buy every one of those buyback guns. Gun destruction would work, but there are laws in virtually every red state that say you cannot destroy those guns because some of them are valuable. You should sell them on auction. Mm. All right? It's a circular. Hi, Malcolm. Hi. So, so far this year, we've had well over 300 mass shootings in the U.S., mm -hmm. one of which happened in my block here in D.C. on April 22nd. So given your background, um, how are you discerning these events in your mind? How are you discerning them be between being acts of insurgent domestic terrorism versus something else? Okay, there's just general random gun violence in the United States. That's just a fact, right? Now, what's insurgent violence? Well, if you see these shootings like we had in Uvalde and other places, they all have a model that they're based on. And that was the mass murder by Anders Bering Breivik in Norway, when this Norwegian guy, right-wing extremist extraordinaire, wrote a hundreds-page-long manifesto on why the white race is being overtaken, and racial impurity and dirty immigrants being allowed to come all the way to Norway, where it's white with the snow, right, and, and sully their nation. And he, he would actually write what the white race uniform of, of, the, of, the, of the knights who would defend, you know, I mean, this guy had an entire, you know, Game of Thrones fantasy world in his head. And he wrote it all into his manifesto. And, but one of the things he did, it was he would describe why I did it, why you should do it. What kind of gun did you use? Why did you select that gun? What kind of bullets did you use? Why did you select those bullets? And it seemed to get a little silly until the second one happened, and it was that his entire manifesto was a template. Good example is um, the shooting in Christchurch, New Zealand, where the guy went live. I actually saw the end of the live stream. We were watching. Somebody goes, go to this channel, go to this channel, go to this channel. I look at the link, and I'm like, someone's shooting people, live streaming it. And I realized it was a mosque. And, and this guy had crazy things written all over his, his book, all over his weapon, right? Like Vienna, you know, the, you know, the Battle of Vienna, where they stopped the Muslim advance. And I go, this is Anders Bering Brevik stuff. And then the one in Poway happened. Pittsburgh happened. All of these had these little templates all over them. However, what happens when that goes away from the individual crazy gamer you know, young man with an AR-15, and it goes to organized groups who decide they're going to become the Irish Republican Army here in the United States. And they've got their version of Sinn Féin, right? The Republican Party explaining away how none of this is terrorism and that none of them and their party are terrorists, but I support everything they stand for, right? We, we you know, normal violence in the United States is an anathema. You're going to know it when you see it, when the Titus decides that, as they say on their forums, when are, what's, what's it gonna, where's our breaking point? That's the question they always ask. What's our breaking point? They can't answer it, but someday they're gonna answer it and it's gonna be unhealthy. Next question. Hi there. Um, I came in late, so I, admit, yeah, and I don't wanna, so I don't know if you Don't worry about it, there's a whole book you can read. Okay, great. <laughs> and this, this might be off topic too, but, uh, but the last time I saw you on television, you were in Ukraine and you were, you were geared up and ready to go. Um, so I wanted to, I wanted to ask you, you know, ob obviously it doesn't make much sense for you to be there anymore. Oh um, no, I'm going back next Friday. Oh, you are? Yeah, oh, I'm, okay. yeah, oh, I right. was in the Ukrainian army. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, can, is, uh, I'm sorry if you covered this before when I wasn't here, but is there any, uh, I'd like to know What's why, the why you, you know, I thought that you hadn't, you weren't going to go back. Why did you leave? Why did you come back? What made you decide that you needed to, you know, I just wanted to know what yeah. you take on the ground. Because my friends happened. were being killed and we received calls the day of what we call Z Day, right? The invasion day. Yeah. And I had a few weeks before been in Donetsk at the forward area of, of the Joint Task Force, and I had met people that I knew um, who were graduates of the American Defense Language Institute. And they called that day and they said, Malcolm, we're gonna die today. There's Jeez. hundreds, they had received like 50 rounds in a year being fired at them. They had received 300 in, the, in like four hours. Mm -hmm. And they were being pulverized. And you, you listen to someone you know literally tell you they're going to die. It's going to motivate you. Rounds, you mean artillery or? or R hard art steel, okay. right? The 150. 300, 152 millimeter artillery steel hitting two, 300 per hour Sheesh. on the first day. Now you listen to that. And you're going to go back to that? You're, no. Well, I'm going to go back to it because everyone's taking that. It's equal risk. I had, I've been hit with bigger. 203 millimeter, eight inch naval gun hit my positions. Oh, and wow. it was unhealthy. But. <laughs> Master of subtility, right? Um, but I, I am in the Ukrainian army, or I'm, right now I'm on leave, but uh, I wear armor, I carry a firearm, you know, I carry a weapon, I, yeah. I have a grenade launcher, I'm part of a quick reaction force, I am on the front line. Uh, you know, a lot of these yahoos out there are like, your uniform's not dirty enough. This isn't Iraq. Mm -hmm. It's Central Europe, mm -hmm. okay? We, you know, we, 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 we wash our clothes. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's not by hand. We don't wash it in the stream. We have washing machines. So, you know, some guys who are on the, who, are, who have to dig in in the front, yeah, they get a little dirty. But the average, I actually had that someone ask that about an, a Ukrainian special forces officer who had a burning tank behind him. And Twitter was like, his uniform's not dirty enough. He's got a burning tank behind him, right? He killed it with a clean uniform. So, thanks for your question. Yeah, well, I'm just, I'm, okay. uh, I'm sorry you gotta go back. I, I was hoping to hear that you thought I wish things to God were, were, that were better over there, that I, you didn't have to go back. I wish to God, well, it's, it's better now. I mean, we, we beat like three major combined arms armies yeah. and now have reduced the war down to about 15% of mm. Ukraine's territory. Yeah. But they're mass murdering civilians. Right. This strategy of hitting malls and people, we call that the frustration strategy. Yeah. They're just shooting. They're like, Putin comes in and he goes, strategic rocket force air f bombers. You haven't done anything today. Yeah. Yes, sir. We're doing something right now. You know, the guy's like giving a high sign. And the guy goes, just shoot some missiles into malls. Yeah. Kill some Ukrainians. That's yeah. what they're doing. They mass murder children all the time. You need to go through the photographs and images and determine which wow. one of those images makes you angry. And I'll tell you the one that made me angry. They bought a dead child out of the theater in Mariupol. And there's a video of it. You can watch it. And you can tell. I was a paramedic at one time, in my, well, EMT, in my career. And you can tell the child's dead. He's not breathing. And they hand them over to the two women EMTs. And you can just see their face. I have to try to resuscitate this dead child. And they go through the whole motions. And they start crying. And you know, there was a thousand people in that building there were only 300 survivors which which outrage which murder which rape is going to make you mad enough to support this war past 140 days are we that lazy we're in afghanistan for 20 years yep. all right there are americans wow. over there fighting alongside of them to hold up that wall of democracy because that's what it's about it's not about nato Putin does not want a democracy on his front door because then they'll want it in Russia, right? right? But on this end, we got issues. We, got, we don't have it. We just, how many dead children did we just have right. in this fight? So I hope that answers your question because I got to get to the next one. Sure, good luck. So Thanks. I think we're out of time what? officially for questions. All right. Give me However, that. it's not my fault. I'm just following. <laughs> I'm just following the directions. So, so there's going to be a book signing. So I believe you'll be able to ask your question of Malcolm to, to him directly um, as you get your book signed. Um, but I want to thank everybody for coming. And thank you, Malcolm, for thank writing you, this Zerlina. book. Thank you, Zerlina.
They Want to Kill Americans, in must-read book, very timely. Stay safe, everybody. The signing line will start right here, and the books are available at the register. Long-winded answer. How you doing? Good. All right. I'm gonna get my